Hello, hello. She had to turn it on. There you go. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, there we go. Can you see the screen? Yes. Okay. Well, allow me to introduce myself. What? Are we not ready yet? I'm sorry. sorry. Give me a second. Give me a second. Give me a second. Sorry about that. All this technology. What happened to the days where you just talk to somebody? <laughs> Zoom. All right, well, we have to do it properly. Okay. Since I'm the last person, I got introduced. Oh, you got introduced. Yes, yes, ma'am. Sorry. No problem. <laughs> okay, today's guest speaker is Joyce Moore. I'm going to read off a piece of paper because uh, I can't remember. She's done a lot of stuff. Joyce is a 39-year employee of TPWD and the, tech and the technical guidance biologist, also known as a senior biologist. For the western one half of the Edwards Plateau Regulatory District, which covers 12 counties, Joyce has been a TG biologist since 2004 when she moved back to the Hill Country from South Texas. Joyce works with roughly 100 plus separate properties in the western Edwards Plateau on a regular basis. Uh, she works with four wildlife management associations in Gillespie County, plus additional properties for wildlife tax valuation. She earned her BSF, Bachelor of Science in Forestry from Stephen F. Austin State University in 1983 and began working with TPW several weeks later. Aside from working at the university while enrolled, TPW is the only employer listed on her resume. That's pretty good. <laughs> uh, Joyce spent 20 years as a field biologist in the brush country of South Texas prior to moving back to the hill country. Joyce and her sister own and operate a 150 year old Century Ranch near Bernie. Joyce is one, has one son who is currently a student at Sol Ross State University majoring in wildlife management. And with that, uh, we'll get to Joyce. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to introduce myself again. So, uh, yes, I did spend uh, 20 years in South Texas. I'm officially old. I think I'm one of the oldest employees of the Wildlife Division, Texas Parks and Wildlife. Um, so, but anyway, it's been a heck of a ride, and I love it every day when I do. So, most of my job involves working with private landowners. As you know, this is a private landowner state, and so all of the information that we um, share with, all, with those people who own that land is how to improve their wildlife habitat and manage the populations of wildlife that live there. Um, so it's a very a critical job as we as we look at it. And like I said, we love it and we wouldn't do anything different. As, as you know, that's why it's the only employer I've ever had. Um, so today, well, I'll tell you how this happened. Uh, my boss, Mike Miller, was speaking with Rick and um, talking about potential speakers for upcoming meetings. And Mike had heard me give this presentation at a field day out in Ozona, Texas, um, to a group of uh, new landowners out there. Those are pretty traditional landowners, if you know what we're talking about, Crockett County. And um, he said, you know, that might be a good thing. Just as a review, I feel like I'm speaking to the choir today because I know that you do some of these things. Um, meet with private landowners yourselves, but uh, he thought it might be a good review for everyone. So that's what I'm doing here today. And in all those 39 years that I've worked for this department, I've seen some beautiful ranches, but I've never seen one that couldn't be improved in some way. And so <clears throat> that's, I guess that's job security in a way, but it's also fulfilling to see those that are putting all of the pieces of the puzzle together and managing that habitat as wonderful land stewards. So um, what we have here lately and what we've seen a shift in is of land ownerships. What I've seen for the past 20 or 30 years was traditional landowners, landowners that have inherited that land and they've been on that land for several generations. Um, 
And so they're continuing to do those same practices that they that their grandfather did and their great grandfather did, and they've learned for all those generations. But now we're starting to see this generational shift, a transition, if you will. Um, I like to call them new to the land, uh, for lack of a better term. They are purchasing property for recreation, and they're not necessarily wanting to produce an ag product off of that land. And so in a way, it's a win-win for wildlife habitat and, and for those populations, but they have to be managed. And so these people, most of them know really not much about what to do. And so if they'll just ask, our services are available for them. And so that's what we're gonna talk about today. I would rather these folks ask first before they destroy habitat and then ask later and we can't we can't fix it. So so um, as a as a private lands biologist or a technical guidance biologist, you'll hear those terms used interchangeably uh, within our agency. And now they're trying to rename me again and and um, so I'm a senior biologist. So pick whichever one you want, but uh, and I'll answer to any of them. Um, I work within the Private Lands and Habitat Program of Texas Parks and Wildlife. And under that program, you're probably familiar with a lot of these separate programs that are under that larger umbrella. And we're going to talk about each of those today. Uh, landowner assistance, which is probably 90% of what I do, but we also work with folks who need to shift their valuation from ag to wildlife. Um, we work with wildlife management associations. We work with the Lone Star Land Steward Program and the Landowner Incentive Program and PUB, which is Pastors for Upland Birds. So all of these are important pieces of the puzzle, as I said, um, and our biologists, who many of them have years of experience, not maybe as many as I do, but they're, they're very familiar with hill country habitats, assessing those, um, and sharing that knowledge with the landowner. We teach these folks to read the land, basically. And through this effort, um, our agency feels like we hope is. We hope to reverse the decline in, in our states um, and the quantity and the quality of our wildlife habitat in Texas. We want to improve the quality of the habitat that remains. And so um, that is our basic premise. So the first one, the one that I work in most, and that is the technical guidance program. Um, all of our field staff, as I said, are very familiar with hill country habitats. They've done it, many of them for years. Um, no problem? No, you're good. Okay. Um, but we develop sound wildlife management programs on these acreages. And, and Rick mentioned I worked with or worked with over 130 different tracts of land. Uh, in the entire western half of the Edwards Plateau. I cover 12 counties um, from here and Fredericksburg all the way out to the Pecos River. So I see a lot of unique country. I just, like I said, I see some beautiful ranches, but um, all of our biologists will promote management practices that are going to maximize wildlife potential and prevent waste and the depletion of the resource. Um, we work one-on-one -on -one with private landowners because, as again, they own the habitat where these animals live. We also work with wildlife cooperatives, management cooperatives, and, and we will conduct a site visit and provide advice to the landowner based on their goals and their objectives. That's always the first thing we ask. When a landowner calls me on the phone, I'm asking him questions about where his property is, how large it is, um, getting directions. But I'm also I'm also asking him questions about what are, what's he see, what's his vision for the property, and that 
And that amazingly is some of them don't know. And um, I always say to myself, well, how do you know when you've gotten there if you don't know, don't have a roadmap? And so that's what we try and help them tease out. And in some cases we can, and in other cases we can't. But, but we do provide that assistance. And that is a major part of our job. And so one of those side visits, okay, so whenever we step foot, before we step foot on any piece of property, we will, we need, we need permission because again, this is a private landowner state. And so all of the assistance that we offer at Texas Parks and Wildlife, verbal, written, regardless of what it is, um, it's confidential. And we cannot share that with anyone. And that is based on the House Bill 2012, Section 12.0251 uh, to our Parks and Wildlife Code. And that just says that any information collected in response to a landowner request for technical guidance on private land relating to the location, species ID, or quantity of any animal or plant life is confidential and may not be disclosed. So that's a protection for the ranch, for the landowner. Um, our staff makes recommendations based on sound science and their knowledge of the hill country ecosystem. It is free. Services that we provide are free um, and completely voluntary. So compliance is completely voluntary. Okay. <laughs> And in addition to Texas Parks and Wildlife offering these services, there are other state agencies, federal agencies that also provide technical assistance. Um, is there a charge for the Parks and Wildlife Land Assistance Program? Uh -huh. Okay, and how do you how do you rate the charges or the buy? The time spent, or how do they do what? Kathy, sorry. How do they wait? Is there a charge for the service that you provide? A charge for the service when they come to your land and oh. you have this technical discussion with them? Is there a charge for that? All service? of our services are already paid for because you're buying whenever you buy uh, any kind of firearm, ammunition, like um, any kind of camping equipment, camera equipment, binoculars, all of that has a federal excise tax on that. And that is what pays our salaries. So you basically, that's why we work for free, free of charge. Was that your question? Yeah. Well, I'm not gonna cover it in detail tonight because we give uh, workshops on that subject that will take about four hours. So, but yes, the property must be it's revenue neutral, and wildlife is a form of ag, but the property must be an ag before it can be shipped over to wildlife. So one, you cannot just go in the wildlife one day. You have to be an ag already. So will that change, or is that going to stay that way for the foreseeable future? Or I know it won't change, but it could. Okay. Are we yes, all right. running? Mm -hmm. Okay. So all of these uh, different agencies that we see on the screen here also provide technical assistance, not just our agency, but Texas A&M Agri Life Extension, the NRCS, the Forest Service, Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, we, we work with several partners. Um, that's called, that stands for Oaks and Prairies Joint Venture or Quail Forever. And you'll hear me talk about them in a little bit. Um, universities, private consultants, of course, you will be paying them. And look there, the Texas Master Naturalist. And we do appreciate all of your help uh, with those type of site visits. Uh, there are some landowner groups that have been trained in prescribed fire, management of prescribed fire. And so and the Texas Prescribed Burn Association also provides technical assistance. And because Landowners talk to one another. Some of the best 
salesmen for this are other landowners. So talking to each other is some of the best advice you can get. All we're trying to say here is don't limit yourself to one source. So when we go onto a piece of property, one of the first things that we do is we're trying to assess the habitat. So plant diversity is key to wildlife diversity. Without a diverse habitat, you can only attract so many different species. And so um, one of the things that we're doing when we look at the land, we're reading the land, we're letting the land tell us something about what's happened there before, before we got there, as far as in uh, grazing utilization, if that land was overstocked with, with livestock, that's a problem. And we can tell it based on the utilization on our, on our range of plants. Um, so one of the first things that we do is we, we try to complete a baseline inventory. We're looking at all of the vegetation on that property, the unique species that are there. And we're teaching, we're with the landowner. Landowner is learning with us. And um, you would be amazed how many don't know what the plants are on their property. Um, I can't tell you the number of times I hear, well, is that what that is? And, um, you know, they just haven't, they just, for whatever reason, they haven't picked up a field guide and, and learned what those plants are. So in, in that process, we're, we're trying to determine what, what does that property have? What plant species does my land offer for food and for cover? And what species would that would they would it best be managed for and are those species available year-round so we focus on the woody browse component because that's their 24 7 forbs are definitely dependent on rainfall and uh, and grasses also so uh, the woody browse component is there and so we're looking at those and we're completing an inventory of all the different woody species on that property and then we're also trying to monitor the recovery of the habitat over time there you go. so uh, again we're monitoring the habitat and we're looking at utilization of plant growth uh, on that property browse surveys um, we do cursory observations, but then we also do stem counts. We're actually counting the number of bitten stems on that landscape. Um, those will determine land health, and, and they're, they're based on the degree of browns use. We look at current year's twig and leaf production, and, and they're a simple tool that we, that we use to determine land health. And because woody plants grow very slowly, changes are difficult to detect in a single growing season. So stem counts help us to enumerate those, put a number on it, if you will, those changes. We also use um, excluder cages there in the center. Where's my little pointer? <laughs> Never mind, it's okay. Uh, in the center there, ex excluder cages are a way to um, right there um, to monitor that those browsing changes the use changes over time and they're a great visual yardstick for measuring that um, we're keying in on certain plants we know what plants are highly preferred by certain species and, and mainly the species that we manage for or, or get receive calls about our white-tailed deer and so because they're on the top of the of the uh, you know the habitat chain, if you will, they're the largest ungulate out there, so they're going to have the greatest impact, and the other species are going to fall in line underneath them. But um, but we're looking at those changes on the landscape. We also want to monitor, as I said, over time. So we're having folks put in photo points, which are a good way to monitor those changes over a long period of time. Those are visual signs that biologists use to measure browse use. <laughs> and then also creative use of slash. Slash is an important tool. You're cutting that cedar, so you might as well put it to work in your, that will help you. So we're actually having them cover regenerating plants 
wisdom of that old slash to prevent her memory, to prevent a browsing by the large ungulates. And of course, we have white tailed deer, we also have exotics, uh, along with livestock. So, all of those animals are eating and they're all utilizing the same habitat. We teach landowners how that excessive use is, uh, what danger signs to look for in an abused habitat or an overutilized plant community. Um, and these are just some examples of that. Um, how often do you see this driving through the whole country? Very common. Um, that's long-term over, overuse of live oak, which is not a highly preferred deer food. It's a moderately preferred deer food. And, um, but when they create that landscape, um, that's, that's a problem. And if that is probably started by shooting the goats right there, and, and deer just continue to do the damage. This is Texas oak, which is a number one, a highly preferred deer food, or Spanish oak. And when they when they change the growth form, like they have here on this Netley factory, they're hedging those plants. That's a danger sign. If they're doing that on their first choice, now if you're doing it on your second or third, that's even more of a danger sign. Uh, we, we see this regularly, understory thinning below four feet. Um, that's on redwood and shino. Also, uh, a first and a second, or a preferred and a moderately preferred plant. So we show them what an old browse plant near the Almera land looks like. And then we also try to show them What, it, what a uh, recovering habitat looks like, or a healthy, regenerating habitat looks like. Um, this is important to provide food, but also to maintain the necessary cover that most of our wildlife species require. Um, and of course, that recovery is dependent on several factors, namely weather. Weather is very important. It's one of the most significant factors that impact habitat recovery. And of course, we're in a, in a drought right now. Um, but the other thing, and a lot of people forget this, maintaining animal numbers within the current capacity of the habitat. So too many animals, too many mammals on the range, whether they be wildlife or livestock, um, is, is not good. And, it, and it's also um, important to balance those stocking rates of, of livestock with the available forage so that it will have long lasting effects on our habitat. Um, that large photo that's regenerating live oak and the slash again is, is actually protecting that regenerating live oak. So that, you want to see that. You want to see multi, multi height uh, regeneration of, of live oak. Point leaf sumac there in the little cage. We call that a natural cage. It's, it's some, some slash that's actually caused and protected that, that plant. And that's the flame leaf sumac escaping up through that. But you can see the brown they use on, on the edges of it right there. So when you start seeing plants like this one with net leaf hackberry growing up in a thorny uh, patch of persimmon, that's persimmon and agarita mostly around that plant. When you start seeing that on your property, then you've got too many animals on the range and those and they're utilizing those highly preferred species. So um, on some ranches, you see it almost exclusively and the others, not so much. And so if they can get to it, they shouldn't, they shouldn't be eating everything down low. There should be some, some growth there and regeneration occurring. Okay. Now, assuming that the tangible goals have been developed by the property, and the next step um, is to estimate populations and what's, what's eating this habitat. Uh, and approximately, we have to have an estimate. It's hard to manage an unknown. So we need to have an estimate of what's out there um, so that we can develop an educated harvest recommendation for the property. 
So data collection is a very, very important part of management. And most of this data collection pertains to big age species, like we talked about, um, all of which can be hunted uh, during a regulated season. Um, in this case, census data provides an estimate of total numbers, uh, total deer numbers, and that acts as a benchmark from where management can begin. Um, we accomplish this through annual fall population surveys. Um, of course, the type of survey is dependent on habitat type and visibility. Um, in the Hill Country, we use the tried and true spotlight survey. That's, that's been the meat and potatoes of what we've used for years. In South Texas, they do a lot of their aerial work doing the population surveys from helicopters and fixed swings. Uh, and now drones are even becoming popular for use uh, for this. So we, we're gathering data and every piece of data that we gather is important. Um, game camera surveys, we do have folks try to use those, but it, it's difficult to um, estimate populations using those. Um, so that, that survey type, but it does provide good information on individual animals. So the quality of your buck herd, for example, you can assess very well on, on photographs that way. For non-game species, we can use other types of surveys, but, but we're not necessarily trying to put a number on it uh, as far as uh, estimated density. We're, we're just looking for presence absence, basically. Um, so point counts, for songbirds, that, that is a way that we do try and, and estimate population density. And we also do um, game bird production surveys that helps us estimate hatching success. And um, then the center photo there, that's actually for herps, determining presence and absence of for reptiles, lizards, and snakes, and I don't know if you can see, but right in the center of that, um, Flashing is a bucket, a five gallon bucket in the ground. Um, that would be difficult to do here, but this is a photo from South Texas. And so the lizard basically hits the flashing and goes to the middle of the bucket, falls in the bucket, and then you have to check out what it is. But that's another species uh, presence absence estimator right there. So those are just some examples, but Regardless of the species, there is a census technique that's usually been um, developed to estimate density, uh, or at least to determine presence. Survey techniques are suggested that will adequately monitor population levels and allow the development of game harvest quotas, which is what we're doing. So we explain that to them. We explain the costs of all of these practices, these survey methods. And then we actually prepare a harvest recommendation for them. Yeah, it's all based on their goals and their objectives for the property. Um, they report that data back to us and we analyze that data, population density, estimates, sex ratio, fawn survival. All of those are important numbers that we use. <clears throat> and uh, we offer them a harvest recommendation to help them meet the recommended or their, their goal that they stated at the beginning of our visit. And we usually do this in a, in a written format, uh, harvest recommendation document. The use of proper harvest as a management tool is, is a very important uh, aspect of, of all management practices. You can't manage it if, if you don't know what you have and you can't um, you aren't successful with your management program if, you, if you're not utilizing the tools that are available. So um, age structure, top production level, and sex ratio are all emphasized. And in some cases, um, when they have too many animals, for deer, for example, um, they utilize specialized deer permits. And I and I go on, and I don't want to go into that too too much in detail. But um, the managed land deer permit is another one of our programs, very popular program, um, and it offers landowners that type of a tool for removing surplus animals. Um, otherwise, we we know it as the MLD, 
Um, you know, we're an agency of acronyms. So this is an incentive-based land management program that's designed to foster the stewardship of natural resources on private lands in Texas. And the program started in 1998. So it's been around for 20, almost 25 years. And uh, it ex offers extended hunting seasons and liberal bag limits to aid in the management of whitetail production, population management. The goal of this program is habitat improvement. The whole goal of it is to improve the habitat. There are two options for this program, the harvest option and the conservation option. Each of them have different requirements. Um, the harvest option is a, an automated self-help, if you will, option that does not require assistance from a parks and wildlife biologist. Um, no wildlife management plan is required. No previous census or harvest data is required. And you go online and you, 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 it'll issue the permits to you. Uh, and it's based on acreage, number of acres you have. The deadline to apply for that one or enroll for that one is September 1 every year. It's an annual enrollment um, and it costs $30 per property. It is only for white-tailed deer, not the old deer. The conservation option, which is the more liberal one and the one that most people uh, want to participate in, because it provides extended seasons, much longer seasons. Um, their season starts October 1 and goes all the way to the end of February on the conservation option for, for all speed of all part uh, white-tailed deer, bucks, does, and, and uh, yeah, antler bucks and, and females also. Whereas the harvest option is only for um, the early part of the season is only for dough and spike. So uh, it offers, again, more options for the landowner. But it does have more requirements. It requires a written wildlife plan, past current data, two years of previous census data, two years of previous uh, harvest data. What's that? <laughs> and, and harvest quotas developed by, by our staff. Um, because this one has, requires more input from our staff, it costs more, it's $300 for every, for the first management unit, and then 30 for each additional management unit. Um, the goal again of this whole program is long-term habitat improvement. And there are a lot of ranches in Texas that utilize this program. So the site visit then, we've, we've, we've We've had our initial site visit. We probably had several others in that time period before we got to this point. Um, then it culminates in a written wildlife management plan and if the landowner so chooses. And this is a, a living document. It provides a sense of direction to uh, achieve those goals and objectives. And it should be redone every few years, revised, re-updated. Um, but it includes several parts, and those are the, are the parts that, that each a good wildlife management plan should include. It should have stated goals and objectives, identifying your targeted species, um, describing the habitat. The habitat assessment needs to be in there. Land use history, well, how, what was on this property, what, what type of grazing system was here, stocking rate, all of that, that's important. Um, the census and harvest history is also important. And what, then our recommendations, what are the recommended habitat enhancement practices that we feel could improve that property and get them to where they want to be, um, based on, again, on their objectives. Population management strategies as well. How many how many animals should they take off? And we will actually issue those tags to them. Um, and sometimes the numbers are large. Um, it's, it's difficult to achieve those goals sometimes. And then we also have a little bit in there about uh, recommendations for at-risk species or threatened species, um, because that's also important. And these plans 
Although they're important for the landowner, they're also required for several state and federal and even county tax appraisal districts. So this type of plan, it may not be the exact plan you turn in for your 1v1 wildlife evaluation, but it could be a part of that. And um, so, so that's important. All right, and as you know, wildlife don't know boundaries, they don't know fence lines. And so we have, uh, in, in parts of Texas, this is more prevalent than it is here in this part of Texas, but um, I work with four of these organizations. They're, they're like-minded landowners that have come together um, to try and manage on a landscape scale. They're working toward a common goal and they, they form what's called the Wildlife Management Association. And most of these groups um, try to cooperatively manage their game species. And in our area, it's usually gonna be white-tailed deer, but there are bobwhite quail co-ops uh, in, in certain parts of Texas. These are landowner-driven organizations. They form to improve the quality or the quantity of at least particular species. Um, and they approach management in a pro more practical way across a larger landscape. So um, they operate through a set of written bylaws. They have dues that they are paid, and and they do they are effective. But at the same time, they're learning. The, the members are learning. Um, they allow their neighbors. You meet your neighbors and work together to achieve a common goal. They assist with census surveys. Then they help facilitate educational programs and field days. Um, and this is important in Texas as our tract sizes in Texas are shrinking. Um, they're an important link to managing our state's wildlife habitats. So some of the benefits, um, again, are it's an opportunity to meet your neighbors and, and there are more eyes on the ground looking. So it, it has effectively decreased poaching in a lot of areas where that used to be a problem. And it, all the members, if they lease their land for hunting, they, they get a reduced hunting lease license fee if they belong to a wildlife management association. So uh, that also helps. So it helps us to uh, lessen the fragmentation of habitat because we're managing on, on a larger scale. Okay. Texas Parks and Wildlife also advocates the use of prescribed fire as a habitat management tool. Um, range fires, uh, either natural or man-made, have played an integral role in shaping our habitats and, and keeping them and maintaining them in a grassland state. Uh, fire is a natural ecological factor in which native vegetation is well adapted. Um, but it's since the mid 1800s, man has suppressed fire. And uh, that's resulted in the landscape becoming dominated by woody overstory species. And here in the whole country, by suppressing these range fires, that's allowed ash juniper to take hold in many of our many, much of our rangeland and other invasives, not just ash juniper, but it's it's caused it to overtake rangeland when they used to burn periodically. Um, but we're mimicking today. We're, we're actually starting fires and under a controlled situation that it allows the reestablishment of plant diversity on that landscape and it removes those invasive. Uh, plants, in this case, ash juniper in our area. So we're setting back plant succession is what we're doing. Um, one more, if you don't mind. Okay. Yeah, we have, we employ a regional burn specialists. Um, Wesley Evans is ours here in the whole country and they, they provide one-on-one -on -one technical assistance also on private lands. They'll, They'll conduct site visits and they'll write burn plans um, and even help with the burn implementation when it comes time. So these guys are very uh, good at what they do and uh, they're very safe. And we're talking, we're not talking about wildfire here, we're talking about a controlled 
fire under specific weather conditions and wind speed and relative humidity, uh, we're not just lighting matches wherever. So this is a very uh, strategic process and very thought out process. The only problem is there's so few of these guys and so many people wanting to burn. And so um, there's a waiting list usually. And so there are private consultants that do that and that can help you do that. And that's where the burn associations come in. That's what those folks do. They burn land all over and they, and it's a neighbor helping neighbor situation where if you, if you go help with some burns and they come help you, you become a part of their burn association. And I don't know what the requirements are if you have to help with three, three burns and then they'll come help you on, on your land. So we get more land burn that way um, and set back plant succession. Okay. So in, in 1995, uh, Texas voters approved Proposition 11, which amended um, the Texas Constitution to permit agricultural appraisal for open space land devoted to wildlife management. And then House Bill 1358 amended our Texas tax code even further to allow wildlife management as an agricultural use uh, for lands that qualify for 1D long agricultural grazing. So it, this now provides landowners with a current 1D1 ag valuation, an opportunity to switch to a from a traditional qualifying ag practice like running livestock, for example, to wildlife management um, and maintain the current valuation, revenue neutral, okay? Um, uh, around that, oh, we'll go back up one more. Okay. So around that photograph, you'll see several of the practices that are allowable under, under this uh, wildlife well, tax valuation. There are seven practices that you always hear about. You must be doing at least three of, of those. You do not have to do all seven uh, on your property, um, but uh, there, there are several illustrated there. Uh, habitat enhancement would, be, would include removal of ash juniper. That's the easy one in our part of the world. Uh, and prescribed fire is another one there. Uh, supplemental shelter up at the top and also the, the nest box here down the lower left. Uh, that's providing supplemental shelter. Um, snags are important for supplemental shelter for some species, so that counts. So we have lots of dead trees in the whole country, so we don't have to remove every one. They can be considered supplemental shelter. Um, Supplemental water, census, which we've just discussed, and then predator control, which that's a cover trap, that's what that is, on a trailer. And uh, does everybody understand about the brown headed cowbird and the problems that, that that species provides or causes for our songbird population? So it's considered a predator. Um, and you can also remove access deer, all the exotic species that, that falls under actually under habitat enhancement and uh, because it's removal of a, an invasive species, whether it be a plant or an animal. So feral hogs fall under that category, access deer fall under that category. And both are increasing exponentially, exponentially. So um, now you can move on, sorry. Okay. Um, so, in order to switch over to wildlife tax for wildlife for tax purposes, the land must first be appraised as qualified open space. That's important, and it must also meet what's known as a primary use standard, and that means it must be actively managed, and the management activities must be given priority over other uses and secondary uses should not interfere with the wildlife practices or cause a detriment to that species being managed. 
Because the first thing it will ask you to do is to choose a local species. And so everything you write in that plan must address the habitat needs of that local species. So the whole document revolves around choosing your focal species. Rulemaking authority continues to rest with the individual appraisal districts based on both the minimum size requirement and a written wildlife management plan. And if that property has been partitioned since the previous tax year, then that minimum size requirement definitely kicks in. And as we were visiting about a while ago, um, every county has a minimum acreage requirement. Uh, I think Gillespie is 12 or 15. I don't know what Kerr is. Uh, every every county in Texas has a minimum size requirement. And so um, you need to check with them on that. Uh, individual appraisal districts. Landowners must also conduct a minimum of three practices, like we just discussed, and meet a degree of intensity standard. And that is set by Parks and Wildlife for each practice. Uh, and then for more information, I, we would suggest that you uh, call the local appraisal district or go to our website, and there is a uh, the web page right there where you can find a lot of information on our on our website. We also that photo is an example. We have uh, we have learned that there are far more people requiring our assistance than we can physically visit their properties, and so uh, especially on the eastern side of the plateau, my coworkers have developed wildlife tax valuation workshops that people can attend either virtually or in person. And these are free. Um, they take about four hours uh, morning and they go through all of the different requirements for 1v1 and show examples. And then if additional help is needed, they can then schedule a site visit and come to the property. So um, I believe they have attendees from 60 plus counties in Texas at these workshops and they usually start having them in the fall. So probably October, November, uh, they'll start having the first one and they'll go they have one a month uh, through April. And um, we have a lot of people attend those. All right. We're talking now about the Landowner Incentive Program, or LIP, L-I-P. This is a, one of the first government programs in, in the nation that focused exclusively on paying or cost sharing to landowners to help conserve rare plants and animals and plant communities on private lands. Um, the Texas legislature, along with the governor support, uh, made funds available originally to assist landowners in conserving rare species and um, <laughs> they made available through the Endangered Species Act uh, for the purpose of conserving rare species. If you notice there, the tagline says for at-risk species and priority watersheds. So go to the, and those are the, those are some examples of our, some of our at-risk species. Um, Houston toad is in there. I'm not sure which muscle that is. The monarch, um, lesser prairie chicken ocelot, uh, Louisiana pine snake. And there you have our golden shaped warbler. And that's the one that's probably the most notable here in this part of the world. And there are uh, management strategies, habitat enhancement strategies for that species that if you have a good project, um, we can help get, get one possibly funded, but it is competitive. You can go on to the next one. Um, and then along with that, the, uh, the watershed is also just as important as the species. So um, it's a collaborative effort between Texas Parks and Wildlife Wildlife Division and Inland Fisheries Division um, to meet the needs of private landowners. That means we're trying to enact good conservation practices on the land for the benefit of healthy terrestrial 
and aquatic ecosystems. Because as you know, what happens on the uplands ends up in the creek uh, or in the spring. And so good management needs to happen high up, in other words, so that when, when it gets to the waterway, it's, it's also benefiting and not degrading those, those waterways that we have in the whole country. So LIP is funded through a cooperative agreement with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Partners for Fish and Wildlife Program. And all the projects approved for funding are subject to the terms and conditions of that, of that program. Um, we're, we're trying to promote healthy watersheds is what we're trying to do and then benefit the natural resources and the people uh, of Texas. So um, submission deadline for a proposal is February the 1st of each year. You can go to the next slide, Rick. Um, this just shows you a breakdown of the priority watersheds in Texas. And if you'll notice, it's pretty gray where we are. So it's, it's a high priority area. All the counties that we're, we're talking about that you probably work in uh, and live in uh, are, are highlighted there. The Guadalupe, the South Llano, the Pergnalis, uh, all the river systems basically are considered priority um, here in Texas, in the central part of Texas or in the whole country. And again, they're prioritized based on watershed and they're prioritized based on their direct benefit to a protected species. So again, they're uh, administered by both wildlife and inland fishery staff and sometimes even US Fish and Wildlife Service staff. So this uh, photo here is just an example of some of the things that LIP funds trying to protect uh, springs and enhance those spring areas. The next slide has some more examples on it. Um, This is a controlling invasive species that could be in the form of animal or plant. Uh, so <clears throat> that's elephant ear on the south level. They're trying to control that with, with a water shaped curbicide. That also includes a rundo, china berry, a number of invasive exotic plant species that also, uh, that also can uh, relate to bone. Uh, Brown-headed cowbirds and axe steer, uh, you know, and, and feral hog. So all of those be considered invasive species. <clears throat> Erosion control on upland habitats. Uh, this is an example of a, a rock berm that was built up on the, this is up on top now. It's up on the top of the hillside. But um, again, everything that starts, the water starts up there. And so it, it definitely impacts. This was uh, the site of the 2011 uh, Oasis wildfire. So there, they laid that land there, about 10,000 acres of it there, uh, south of Junction. And so there was a lot of erosion coming down into the South Llano. And so uh, a lot of these programs are trying to reduce soil erosion and runoff by, by slowing the water down as it's coming down the side of those slopes. Um, again, here we're back to herbivory, usually by white-tailed deer and our exotic species. So caging, excluding, excluder cages are important. Uh, that's another practice that's come. So this will be the 26th year uh, that we honor excellence in out and outstanding accomplishments on private lands regarding habitat conservation and and management wildlife conservation. This is called the Lone Star Land Steward Awards. You've probably heard of it. Um, in fact, um, we're having a banquet in two days in Austin. Um, this is a ranch that happened to be in Crockett County and they won this award in 2021, the Wood Walker Seven Oaks Ranch. So that's why I have it here just as an example. But um, it does recognize private landowners for their contributions to land, water, and wildlife stewardship. And because 95% of Texas is under private ownership, this is these lands are important. And these practices that folks like you do on your private land is very important. Um, 
And so we celebrate that and we nominate ranches that are doing uh, excellent work on their lands. And the selection is based on a set of criteria, including um, habitat restoration and enhancement, the uniqueness of the project, um, community involvement, and if you're opening your gates and teaching others about what you're doing, that's even more important. Um, conservation easements are important also for this. Winners are chosen by ecoregion. And um, this they won, this, this ranch won for the Edwards Plateau ecoregion that year. Um, and then we also choose one statewide winner that receives the Aldo Leopold Conservation Award uh, from the San County Foundation. The funding from this program supports the Parks and Wildlife's Private Lands and Habitat Program, and, it, and the program enables our field staff, like myself, to uh, apply that habitat conservation on these private lands. It makes a very real and lasting impact on the conservation of Texas land, the waters, and wildlife. Um, this ranch, it, again, as I said, is in Crockett County. Um, three generations of the family have stewarded this ranch, and we see two of the brothers there in the photo, the bottom photo. Uh, they have their three boys, and uh, it was established in 1934, and it's been, again, they, they manage it on a holistic approach. They manage for horned lizards as much as they do, like tail deer. You'll see the little species there on their side, or a little horned horn lizard on there. Um, pollinators, they do it all. And um, more than anything, this ranch has, has forged partnerships with various organizations, uh, helping them manage this property uh, for wildlife. They utilize prescribed fire almost exclusively to manage their juniper problem. They, in Crockett County, they have red berry juniper, mm -hmm. which is very difficult to manage. And they do it using prescribed fire. But they were a winner in 21. So I think this this year, actually, Mackenzie, I think the winner is going to be out of Comal County. So that will be neat. Okay, this is the Pastures for Upland Birds program. Um, so over the last century, much of our native, much of our native prairie and grassland have been severely damaged by overgrazing uh, or converted to ag agriculture, um, uh, exotic grasses and hay fields, that type of thing. So these land uses include uh, conversion of ag fields to non-native approved pasture grasses like coastal Bermuda, and in this photograph, the, the old and native uh, old world king ranch blue stem that we all love to hate. Um, one of those co the co obvious consequences of this massive prairie conversion uh, was the loss of millions of acres of wildlife habitat. And breeding bird surveys continue to show that most grassland species, bird species, are in decline, long-term population declines because of this. <clears throat> so that has caused grassland bird conservation to become a national priority. PUB, as it stands for PUB, Pastures for Upland Birds, we call it PUB. Um, it promotes grassland bird conservation by restoring native prairie vegetation on exotic grass pastures and hay fields. Uh, it provides cost share incentives and technical guidance to private landowners to do these things so it, it improve those pastures for wildlife. And we're talking about Bermuda grass, Bahia grass, Old World Blue Stems, and again, KR. I think the next photo talks about how we can, um, how you can participate. Um, the photos there are before and after with the prescribed burn. And this is taken a little further east, uh, not right here on Purville. 
But again, it was in 2016, obviously rain good amount that year, but um, it typically includes herbicide treatments to kill the exotic grasses, and then followed by no-till drilling of native grass and board mixtures, uh, seed mixtures. And then it may also include supplemental treatments like ground tilling and herbicide, additional herbicide and planting of temporary row crops. But funding for this uh, program is made possible through a cooperative agreement with, again, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service partners for wildlife, for fish and wildlife. And um, if your property qualifies, then you should probably contact your local biologist and set up a site evaluation and work with that person to develop a project and then submit it, um, hopefully be approved and, and then monitor the progress. And there will be some monitoring, habitat monitoring with that uh, as well, just like LIP had in it. And the last thing I was going to visit with you about, and this is uh, known as the Grassland Restoration Incentive Program, or GRIP, G-R-I-P. Um, so in addition to state and federal agencies providing technical guidance, I mentioned them on that one slide earlier, conservation partnerships also are linked for private landowners, and they can link them up with available cost share dollars. They work... This is the Oaks and Prairies Joint Venture uh, and Quail Forever. And they work very closely with the Natural Resource Conservation Service or NRCS. Uh, in fact, they office in NRCS offices. And so um, this one focuses on upland habitats and grassland birds. So um, they, we're trying to improve native grassland habitat uh, throughout our area. And the green counties there are the West <coughs> Oaks and Prairies Joint Venture. So it's west of here, actually. Those are priority counties. Uh, and it's called the OPJV, Oaks and Prairies Joint Venture Grip. And it includes, it looks like Valverde, Edwards, Real, uh, Uvalde, and Kinney County. And then there's a uh, these are all different joint ventures in Texas. This is the Chabon Desert Joint Venture. Here's the South Texas Rio Grande Joint Venture. Um, so the one that's closest to us here is this Oaks and Prairies Joint Venture. So if you have land out in those counties, uh, you could possibly be uh, qualified for some funding opportunities. Because again, it's uh, bird conservation is the focus. And there's the Coil Forever website. Uh, to get more information for that. I just sort of mentioned it because it was in the program and because I was in Crockett County, it was much closer to this uh, priority area than Kerr County. So the last slide just shows all the various websites that could be helpful to you. Um, when Rick gets it up there. Um, have, ever, have ever, all of you used a, a find a biologist link that you know how to do that? No. Um, on, a, on our website, have you ever tried doing that? I can, I'll show you here in a second. Um, then the MLD permits, that's the website or the link for them. 1v1, the uh, lip hub, and quail forever. So, um, Next slide will show if you want to know who your Parks and Wildlife biologist is for your county that you live, uh, this is our website. And uh, or that's the photo they used at the time I was doing the program. So you'll click on wildlife, select wildlife, and then the drop down, find a biologist. Next, Rick. And then you want to click on Hill Country. Or you can even go into the map and you can click right on, on number four there. And then it'll ask you what county next trip. And this one was the Croc one for Crockett County, but it works the same if it were Kerr or whichever county it was. And so the biologists out there may be in WIT 
And there's all of his contact information right there. There's all of my information and our one life diversity biologist and our supervisor, who is right back here behind you uh, at the personal one life district office. So that's the easy way the, to find your biologist and all their contact information. Um, and the last, I don't know, I'm sure I'm out of time, but uh, the last thing I have is how to request technical assistance from our agency. All of that is done now on a, web, on a website or a database known as Land Management Assistance or LMA. Um, and this is what the home screen looks like of LMA. And so you want to log in. And then the next slide shows you click log in. Next slide, get your information on there. Uh, and, you, and again, you're going to set up your own password so nobody else can see this but you. And you'll have to remember that because we won't know it. And then you'll get an email like this, similar to this. It'll tell you you've set up an account with Texas Personal Online on their LMA online system. So you want to see that email. And then the next slide will show your properties and will be listed there under my sites. Uh, there's nothing there because we didn't actually, you know, create one. But when you do that, your property, Horseshoe Ranch or whatever, will show up there. And you can click on that and draw a Oh, that's the first yes, you'll get this. You'll get this first. This is a request for technical assistance. Um, again, they want to know to have permission for people to come onto this property. And this is an electronic um, request for, for, for technical assistance or RTA. And you just click yes on that. And then you can draw your map of your property. And then you're, after you do that, your name will appear up there. And right here, this is where your, your branch name and all the acreage, the county, um, the address, physical, and you'll need a 911 address. And any people that are associated with that, any agents, you can, you can put the landowner's name or, or you can also invite an agent. Um, and then right here, where it says, contact biologist, you will click on that submit request and the biologist for that county will receive an email and they will know that you're, you are requesting their assistance and they will be in touch with you. So this is an easy way to request technical assistance from our agency is by creating your own account on the LMA site. And that's really all I have. Um, I apologize for all of the technical difficulties. If you have any questions, please shout them out. Yes, Mackenzie. Talk loud, Mackenzie. I'm hard of hearing. Okay, I hope this is loud enough. Uh, you show the slide with the uh, control of patch juniper yes. to restore grasslands. And uh, how does this relate to preserving uh, habitat for the golden chip warbler that needs the ash? I took that slide out because I was trying to save time. Um, so one of the things that that we do recommend for golden cheeks is they require the, the old growth or mature ash for for their nest building material. And of course, they like topography. They want the steeper slope. And anytime you see, and I probably have it on my computer there, pull it back up. But if you see um, habitat that has the dark green, old growth cedar break, what we call them, um, but has hardwoods poking up through that, or they're a different color of green, basically, that, and it's on a slope, you've got golden shake habitat. And so they utilize that stripping bark to build their nest. That's the only nest building material they use. And they weave that together with spider web. That's how they do their, how they build their nest. 
So one of the practices that we recommend is they can't fly. Do you ever notice when you walk into a sewer break with a lot of dead wood and an understory where you can't even walk through it for all the dead wood? So thinning that, removing that dead wood underneath is, is an important improvement to that habitat. Not touching the canopy. Okay, the canopy needs to stay intact. Uh, under limiting, for better lack of a better word, that's one of the practices that we recommend for that species. So the birdie would simply want to burn the smoke with that kind of habitat on it. No. Burning would be not in that habitat, but at the base of the hill, yes. Prescribed fire is important because it's it's creating new growth and, and they're insectivores, so they're gonna catch bugs down in that area. And they're, they're feeding in the canopy on the bugs too. Um, another important thing you can do is trap or remove both of our head encounters. That's, that's important. So those are three of the practices that we recommend for that species anyway, yeah. if you have the habitat. They want, they want something I, know, I think eight happen. inches or, or greater. Yeah. They don't want small cedar. They want thick stuff, yeah, old see, growth. And also, Falcons Canyon Preserve is running for eight inches to get it. They like that side of the day. They like, they like the topography. Uh, I don't know what percent, you know, 3%, 5%, something like that. Yeah, but it's not usually grazable anyway. Where they like to live is pretty steep. And so it's not even practical to run livestock there. Um, and because of the shading element, there's no grass there anyway. So uh, one thing you can do there is if you do clear uh, on those slopes, that you, you windrow your slash and prevent the water from speeding down the side of that hill. So you want to you minimize your erosion as much as possible. So I would recommend hand clearing, number one, because equipment isn't going to be able to work where you're talking about. And and then you want to lay in some windrows across the contour to slow that water down. That's important, um, especially if you have, right, the properties that have the warbler, that have the habitat for the golden shaped warbler, have springs, they like those canyons, those quiet, cool, moist, mesic, I guess, canyons, um, and that's what they love. So it's steep. It's almost always steep above those. So that that is a practice for that species. Any others? Oh. Uh -oh. Did I just unplug you? No. Nah. Uh I don't know where I'm going. So on the M I MLP, right? MLDP, yeah, yeah, yes. MLDP. Well, do they when they're talking about managing the deer and its overpopulation, uh, does it require the whole if, if I live in an association, three thousand acres, does it require all of the residents to want that service? Or does it just take the ranch uh, support directors? <laughs> it's difficult to, if you're in a, like a subdivision situation, mm -hmm. um, everybody's cut, probably got to be all in, okay. all in or all out, okay. uh, because it's a matter of you by yourself harvesting excess numbers of deer, it's, it's just, it's going to create a void that you're just going to get them from other places. So the whole property probably has to be physically managing. The other thing is you don't want to impact your neighbors. Correct. And so if you have, if you're shooting early no, we can't and, shoot, so. <laughs> and, and you're in a low fence situation, because you can start harvesting these animals October 1 with a gun. Mm. And so the neighbors find out that usually doesn't make for good, very good neighbor relations. <laughs> um, so, it, but it's an option if, if everyone's on board and everyone wants to do it. It's certainly an option. But Practically speaking, if you don't have several hundred acres, 
three to four, maybe even 500 acres, it's probably not going to be very effective. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So it's, it's an option. All right. Thank you. All right. Any others? All right. Well, thank you all for your attention. Thank you, Joyce.